When are you going to see that man for what he is? Which one of us are they going to believe I do wonder? And it's coming closer. Hello and welcome to Hooked on the Deceived with me, Maureen O'Connell, our companion podcast to Lisa McGee and Tobias Beer's psychological Irish drama, The Deceived. The series has all the ingredients for the perfect psychological thriller, a big scary house that makes the Bates Motel look rather nice and cosy. None of the locals really seem to be in their right minds and our main character, she slices her finger on a bread knife that somehow made its way into her satchel. She didn't put it there. We have a lot to unpack in episode two, but first, here's a quick refresher of the premise to the Deceived, right? We've got a Cambridge first year student, Ophelia Marsh. She's seduced by her charismatic English lecturer, Dr. Michael Callan, who's about to hit the bestseller lists with his debut thriller about some big old haunted house that he just happens to own and live in. When he mysteriously disappears, Ophelia tracks him down, because that's the thing to do, and discovers that his wife has died in a fire in that big old house. Things get weird and from there, they get even weirder in episode two. But before our deep dive, we're going to talk to one of the stars of the series, Emmett J. Scanlon, who plays Michael. Here's a clip of him in action in The Deceived. Elio, what the hell? Oh my God, oh my God, she's dead. Yes. Oh my God. You really shouldn't be here. You just left. I didn't know where you were. What happened? There was a fire in the house. Please, you have to go, Philip. Please, I'm you so have to sorry. go. I'm so sorry. I came because I had to tell you. Oh my God. Tell me more. What did you have to tell me? Michael, I'm pregnant. That's a little bit there from The Deceived, which has a whole host of Irish talent, not only behind the camera, but also in front of it, such as Emmett J. Scanlon, who plays Dr. Michael Callan. Possibly, um, could he be the most attractive academic ever to have set foot in any college ever? No mind Cambridge, and we are delighted to welcome him to the podcast right now. Emmett, how are you doing? I'm blushing. Did you ever have a teacher that looked like you? (laughs) <laughs> no, I didn't. No, thankfully. But I had nightmares. Yeah, this is what we're doing right now when I'm talking to people who have seen it. I'm like, do you, do you fancy him? And we're wondering if we've got issues if if we do fancy him because uh, Michael's a complicated man, Emmett, isn't he? He is complicated. And when he's on that stage uh, in front of his students, it's almost like he uh, it's that's his audience and he's more himself there and he gets to play and he gets to uh, charm and seduce everybody with his academia, with his knowledge. Uh, And we had to, for one of those, uh, I'm not sure if I made this series, but we had to, I had to learn a massive speech and and give an actual lecture to a room full of extras. And uh, that was, that was a blast. That was one of my favorite days, actually. So I got kind of a, I kind of drunk on the the power of it. To be well, that's the thing. So, was that you could get into the role? What was the lecture on? Uh, oh God! Thanks for testing me on this one. <laughs> um, it was uh, what was it on? Thomas uh, Hardy. He keeps coming up in the deceived. Thomas Hardy. Thomas Hardy. But the the philosophers. Who were the philosophers that I talked about? I don't know. And that is why I am not a lecturer. <laughs> but. You know, when you said there, that's where he's himself when he's on this stage. He's got a willing and captive audience, but also sort of a naive audience and that adoration from younger people that he can be whoever they want him to be. Is that important to Michael that that they put him on a pedestal? Yeah, I mean, there's this there's this thing. You mean, you described the show amazingly better than I could could ever do it. But there's this thing that we're. He's married to a very successful novelist in Roisin, and it's one of the things that he wishes that he could do. And he's only a recently uh, successful novelist himself. And um, But he always, I think, even by his own admission, kind of feels inadequate when he's around his wife, uh, feels slightly inferior. Maybe that's something that he projects onto himself. So, uh, And there's that famous saying, those who can't teach... And uh, so when he's up on that, I mean, where he fails to get the spotlight of his, and he's used to being the center of attention. This is a charming narcissistic man. He's very used to being the center of attention. And where he fails to get that spotlight shone on him from his wife, uh, the eyes of his pupil are that spotlight for him. So I guess he gets to be that ver- uh, a version of himself that he quite likes and quite gets, um, and knows he's very good at. And uh, not that the, the, uh, the, the students are naive, of course, they're, I mean, Perhaps they are and stuff like that, but they're very trusting in in, in a teacher, like a child would be trusting to a parent. It'd be uh, that kind of thing. You're talking about a version of himself. Do you think 
he's yeah. a different person, that there is a different Michael when he goes back home to Donegal. 100%, 100%. I mean, I think, I think we're all like that to some degree, don't you think? I mean, we've all got these social masks that we wear, Lord forbid they slip in real life. You know, my social mask when I'm talking to you is very different to the one that I'm talking to my neighbours or the one that I have when I'm holding my son. In fact, I'm, probably, I'm not even wearing one when I'm holding my son, but it's that, it's that kind of thing. We all have these different layers about us. I'm not sure whether they're, I mean, it's just different layers to the same character. Uh, and that's something that good writing does, at least in my opinion. I mean, if you're lucky, you've got uh, complicated characters uh, and they're just like facets of him uh, making up the totality of who, of who Michael Callan is. And I think that's only derived from great writing, from Lisa McGee, from Tobias Spear. And for, uh, you, to, makes, to, for uh, you to get into that, you, you listened to music you thought that Michael would, would listen to. Was it a playlist that you'd created? I don't, you know, part of part of my process. <laughs> I always feel weird when I say that. Part of my process <laughs> is uh, is compiling a playlist for each and every character. I'm in the process of compiling one again right now. But yes, for Michael, it would I would have certain songs. I imagined he was. <laughs> I imagined he was the type of guy who'd have contemporary jazz playing on his like uh, vinyl player while students came in. Or, like that kind of like thing where like Ron Burgundy's like. Going one thousand and one, one thousand. You asked me. Oh, I didn't. Oh, I can't believe you're here. <laughs> you asked me. Oh yes, of course. Uh, so the, the part of that, that again to add to the uh, to the mask that 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 he liked to show off. Um, but a lot of the songs on my playlist. I mean, for me, music is. It's not enough to know what you're going to do intellectually. You got to feel it. And for me, music is that shortcut to that feeling. It's like having a car with no petrol. No matter how good the car is, it doesn't go anywhere. And for me, music is that petrol. It makes the engine purr. And that's that was that's my shortcut to that to that spot. Maybe when I'm reading scripts, where depending on the scene, uh, for whatever reason, I slap it on, and that's it's just it's just a part of my armor. I can so see Michael holding forth about vinyl being the best and we're all terrible oh, Philistines. A hundred percent. That's brilliant. Oh, yeah, yeah. You got- There's Miles Davis oh. playing in the, in the background while he's smoking a cigarette. You know, oh my God. Hi, how are you? Please you- take a seat. Oh, Thomas Hardy. You just saw that's a hundred percent, a hundred percent him. And then we've got on the opposite side, Michael, who's got all of his pretensions. And then his mate back home, Sean, played by Paul Meskel, who's like the nicest guy in the world, just wants to be friend to everyone and make sure everything's all right. They're like light and shade. Is he, is he the nicest guy? I mean, are you are you looking at Paul Meskel and the deceived or Paul Meskel and normal people? Because I'm like, I'm not going to like, he kind of flirts with Ophelia straight from the bat, straight off the bat, doesn't he? Yeah, but he thinks, uh, then, hey, they're lying because they're saying that Ophelia and Michael have nothing to do with each other. And he sees her and he's like, do you know what? Not too many outsiders come into this sunny Gall town. I'm shooting my shot. And, and, and does he not know that, oh, this is good, actually, because it's been a long time since I shot this in October. Maybe you know better. Does he not know that then we're an item by the, by the end of episode one? Or yeah, during episode but, one? but not at the start. And maybe well, he's well, thinking. Watch that flirtation continue. Even the, <laughs> even the knowledge, you watch that flirtation continue. So when you were sitting there working with Paul Mescal and you're like, dude, you're cracking onto my girl. Go to Love Island. Leave me alone. What's going on? Did you have a bit of crack? Yeah, oh, God, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We had a lot. I mean, but you have to. I mean, we t- I think we've talked about this before. I mean, when you're, when you're doing a psychological thriller, something that is so heavy, uh, you have to find levity any way you can. And when you find it, you milk it for all it's worth. So in between dark scenes, you try and find that laughter. Otherwise, you'll, you'll probably end up getting lost in the tunnel. You did have a beautiful comedic moment in this that was just Lisa McGee through and through, where you're on the phone to Mary, uh, telling her that you've got to go uh, to get your dad in Cambridge. He's had a turn. And she's like, oh, I'll light a candle for him. And then she goes off talking to someone else about lighting a candle. And you're like, Mary, will you listen to me? Did you get that? Did you love that brevity? I love that. I love that. I mean, when you, when you, when you can sneak in stuff like that, it was even like a... A little, like, I'm going to light the uh, candle thing. I even threw in a little Alan Partridge. It was like, okay. Uh, and then I just continued on doing my own thing. It was like, I don't care if you're lighting a candle. I got to go. Mary, listen to me. 
Yeah, of course. And that was, uh, that's, that was a great scene to do because there was a speed and an urgency to that. And it was piss and rain. It was all sorts of stuff that was happening outside. And we had to, it was, I think it was done in one take, coming out of the house into the car. I mean, there's no cut, so you, you mess up the line. We have the AD in the back seat uh, reading in the lines uh, for Mary, but she's not there. So it's, it, was, it was a great scene. I really enjoyed that. And yes, I do love those uh, moments of levity. I do. I, I just love Michael and Mary together. They're absolutely brilliant because she's so sinister. For you, <laughs> Emmett, what was your best and worst moment on set of The Deceived? Great question. Great question. So, uh, OK. Um, so one of the things... <laughs> Getting on set and playing any any character, there's there's no, there's nothing challenging about that. I'm, I'm ferocious when it comes to my homework and when it comes to backstory and all that sort of stuff. So by the time I get on set, I'm ready to play, I'm ready to listen, I'm ready to dance. So the stuff that is challenging for me as the stuff outside of my control, and the stuff outside of my control would be weather, uh, locations, uh, time, time, always time. You're always fighting the clock to try and get the scenes done because you're essentially shooting a, a 12-week shoot and condensing it into eight weeks. So we would, like, if you dropped a scene, and we're like, that type of stuff would break my heart. Like, one of the hardest things for me during that shoot was, um, and I'm not sure if you've seen the series, the whole series, but there's, uh, and I also don't know the episode, I think maybe it's three, uh, but there was this very vulnerable scene that I had to go through, and we were fighting the clock, and we had maybe half an hour to shoot it. And in an ideal world, I wish I had a lot more time. And I think I had one take to get it done, to get it right. Uh, and and, and I, 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 that was probably the hardest thing for me because it broke my heart not having enough time to be able to, 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 to get it, to yeah. find it. Well, I found what I've had to find in that uh, with my back up against the wall. But that's the nature of the beast. I mean, you can't tame the beast. You can only ride it if you're lucky enough for a few minutes. I, ironically, the my favourite uh, moment shooting to deceive was for the same, very same reasons. We were running out of time. We'd half an hour to go, and it was myself and Dempsey had a scene. Dempsey Bavell, uh, a gorgeous human being. Uh, we had a scene with half an hour to go, and I accidentally pressed. Uh, shuffle on my playlist walking up to set and uh, Fine Young Cannibals she drives me crazy so that's one of my songs on my playlist Yeah. and anybody who knows the f- she drives me crazy Fine Young Cannibals knows that you can't listen to that without dancing so that was what I would do you know I, I mean, so the song played and I just couldn't stop it and I just started dancing and then he started dancing and then a couple of the crew members joined in and that <laughs> moment was trying to find levity in the darkness I, I saw Imogen you know, like one of the producers behind the <laughs> behind the frame dancing probably better than that I don't know what that was uh, but we were all we were all trying to give it something and for three minutes we danced and we finished that scene with time to spare it was just, it was an incredible moment. In fact, I probably should apologize to the majority of the, of the crew who had to watch that. For if, um, if you're listening and if you're watching, I apologize profusely. But we got the scene done, so fuck it. I'm, as long as the hey, hey, that's it. But I'm, I'm going to say, if I'm making that into a gif. You just doing whatever dance you just did there. And I expect to see yeah. it in Peaky Blinders, whatever it is that you're doing. It. More dancing from Emma J. Scanlon. I know that you're up to your eyeballs. You've got a brand new baby, Ocean. You're hoping to come home to Ireland soon to see your family and everything. In three, you're coming home. Two weeks. Two weeks time. We will greet you at, are you, are you coming on the ferry? I am, yeah, 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 yeah. We'll greet you with fine young can- cannibals. She, ri- she drives me crazy with a big sign. Welcome home, Emmett. It has been an Thank absolute you. pleasure to talk to you. I loved The Deceived. You were brilliant in it. Thanks a million. Thanks so much. God bless you. You're not the first. You won't be the last. My wife is dead. We set it in motion. When are you going to see that man for what he is? You're not well. No, 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 please. Which one of us are they going to believe? I do wonder. And it's coming closer
Now on Hooked on the Deceived, we're going to turn our attention to episode two. I am joined by our forensic team of Nadine Reed and Gordon Rochford to pull apart the second instalment. But first, let's remind ourselves of some of the main talking points from this episode. Ophelia continues to be creeped out in Nakdara House. Does she leave? Does she leave anyone? Nah, no. no, she she doesn't <laughs> leave. Uh, Michael's dad goes into hospital in Cambridge, so he goes over to get him to bring him back to Nakdara. Not Dara. It's becoming a family affair. Um, he leaves his pregnant girlfriend in the care of his dead wife's mother, Crazy Mary. Mother. Right? So that nuts. That that was just mad. Um, Sean, the very sexy firefighter and builder. I mean, what can't the man do? <laughs> Multitasker. He's mad to stick the gob on Ophelia. It's not even funny. Like it's just overt at this stage. Uh, the psychic Cloda. She arrives to Nakdara, and guess what? She sees dead people, oh, 100%. Jesus. They find out that Ophelia is having a baby girl and at the end, a brand new character is introduced. He's standing in a quad in Cambridge, just lazing against a wall, reading, guess who? Michael's book. And that's it. That is episode two, but there's a lot more to it, isn't it? Oh, yes. There is a lot. Okay, we've got to start with you, Nadine, because oh, okay. after episode one, you were like, Ophelia is crazy. <laughs> How are you feeling after episode two? Um, you know, I have to say she is crazy. <laughs> still. She's not privileged anymore. She's yeah, crazy. Yeah, but it's not just a privileged thing. That's not just a vulnerable <laughs> thing. Um, literally, when I saw the moment when she puts the lipstick on and she's like, I'm like, is this woman haunted? Is she possessed? So is she's she been putting, hypnotized? She's putting on um, Roisin's. Roisin's lipstick. She's putting on her clothes. She's yes. all that stuff. Her perfume. Her, spraying her perfume. Who puts on dead people's makeup and hair sp- and spray? You just wouldn't. Pre-corona, maybe it was okay. <laughs> no, it's no? never okay. You don't share this stuff okay. <laughs> Someone you don't know. Come on, Ophelia. Like, I think she's not. So to me, she's gone from this Alice in Wonderland, Jessica Fletcher character to now Rosemary's baby. So now I'm getting creeped out. Whatever whatever Lisa McGee has planned and Tobias, I'm officially afraid now. Oh. I don't know what's going on. Do you think, Gordon, is she crazy in and of herself? You know, does she have her own issues or... Is she being made to doubt herself and to seem crazy? Well, I mean, Michael's gone back to Cambridge to get his old da. Bring him home. Bring him home. I love but, the uh, da. Yeah, he's the one who's able the to da. keep a Donegal accent straight. Uh, but uh, <laughs> they, they, come on. He's not going, you're not going to stop harping on Michael's lack of a Donegal just, accent. It just pulls me out of knock Dara. It pulls me out of the magic. I didn't ask Emmett about it. Uh, I was like, I won't. I won't do it. <laughs> I'll see him outside. He'll be like, you, yeah. you're <laughs> dead, you. Uh, no, I think I think that there's like um, a kind of a release now that Michael is not there. Ophelia's trying to have a kind of a poke around to see like, where are my limits? Where are my boundaries in this town? Paul is over. Hang it. Paul Maskell's hanging around, smouldering, not to, unlike the house. Uh, kind of being like, hey, you want to you wanna go down to the pub, hey, mm, for a drink? And she's like, I'm pregnant and there's a guy here who might kill me. Um, but I think that Mary really takes up the mantle of the gaslighter, the crazy maker. Uh, Michael's gone. There's a bit of relief and Mary fills in that vacuum by like, I don't know, standing behind people often, interrupting conversations with like weird details. The bit where you were talking about Nadine, where she's putting on the lipstick, where in my mind, there's like a weird like music box, like she's behind and Mary comes up and goes, your perfume smells like my dead daughter. When I found her crispy body, it smelled like you. And I was like, that's not a direct quote now. She had just put the dead daughter's perfume on. But But in a house like that, in a house like that, which we all know is, mm-hmm. you know, you buy a house from four years ago, there's going to be floorboards creaking. Something's going to be creaking. Yeah. And she just, and Mary just appears. It's like she's bewitched. She's done the little nose yes. and she can just appear wherever the hell she wants. But she's, she's hiding right stuff. There. She is hiding stuff. I think that um, Eleanor Methven, who plays Mary, uh. who's Roisin's mother, she is one of the best characters in this. Yeah. She is, you don't know, she's so sinister, isn't it? She feels <laughs> sinister, Nadine. Yeah, completely. I'm petrified, I'm petrified. And as soon as they introduce this like creepy um, school room, baby, sorry, child's room, which is clearly, I guess, Oh yeah. room. So this is in she's Mary's house. Yes. Putting the light bulb into it going, what? the baby will live here forever. Yes. Like yeah. it's weird, man. So hold on, are we in a situation sorry. where you both think that now this has become a baby snatching program. Oh, entirely. Could Maybe. Be. I mean, is Roisin even the mother of, I mean, is Mary really the mother of Roisin? Did she rob her? Does she want to rob Ophelia's why baby? Do think, why do you think Mary just... might be the mother of Roisin? 
why, I don't know, why is she holding onto her child's room with the, the ballerina music box thing? Who <laughs> does that? Hey, she, my she's ex- only just me. died. My she's Jared, just dead a week. <laughs> my Jared Leto and, and George Clooney posters are still up on my room in my parents' house. That's because yeah, your mum's probably alive. able to enjoy them. And do Jared Leto's pet- timeless. Yeah, Good and is there, a, yes. is there a secret key to open that door? No, that is hidden away, even from Sheila. What do you know what I mean? That, isn't, that, isn't that a bit worrying? Why is a door locked? <laughs> Thank you. In, well. in not an old room where you're saving heat, in a normal sort of a semi-D house, yeah. why is there a door locked? I have to say in episode two, there were, there were comedic moments where you're sitting uh. there going... There is Lisa McGee because when she was writing <laughs> Raw, there was really funny moments for Jojo when she did that that series. Uh, and then Derry Girls is so funny. Yeah. There's one moment where you just have Michael on the phone going, <laughs> yes, yeah. my dad rings Mary and he's like, my dad's in hospital in Cambridge. I have to go. Will you mind Ophelia? And Mary says, oh, sure. I light a candle for him. Then Sheila shouts, who are you lighting a candle for? And they have a whole conversation and he's yeah. going, Mary, will you listen to me? I I couldn't stop laughing, Gordon. I just thought, oh, absolutely. genius. He's on the phone going, I'm trying to act. Will you pay attention, please? It was very funny. It was but, a good uh, moment. Good her, moment. Her, uh, her kind of command over the area, it feels feels weird that like he has to go and bring the dad back. Mary's like a woman about town. Very important. It seems like she's not properly grieving or something. There's Hello, some yes. there's some disconnect some in her disconnect. emotions. Some yeah. loads. Her daughter just died. And, and she's, she's dancing and drinking wine Thank and tr- you. dropping a hand on Michael. Come on. Smelling the perfume. So is that, the, the is that why you think Roisin mightn't have been her daughter or do you think there's something more sinister going on, Nadine? I honestly, at this stage, I feel like I have no clue. Ghost, ghoulies, sinister, gaslighting. I think all of these things are probably something to do with this. I'm just here for the journey and I just need to just (laughs) see the next episode so I can work out what on earth is happening. You're you're talking there about ghosts. We one of your favourite characters was properly introduced in this, and that's played by Louisa Harland, who we talked to last week. She plays Clodagh O'Donnell, the seer, yes. and she uh, introduces herself into Roche, to Roisin in the pub. Spots her yeah. goes, "You, you're going to want my services." Love her. Here's and her card. I love it. It's like Here's I won't a te- I'm not going to text you the number. Yeah. Just written it down on a piece. <laughs> there you go, love. There you go. Hold on to that. Don't lose that now. Yeah. So what did you make of Louisa Harlan's kind of Uh, introduction to this otherworldliness that she's bringing? I don't know. It's just that whole classic. She's the perfect. What did what did Lisa McGee write? You know, new age spiritualist person. Right. She's got the nose ring, bohemian skirts like she's really into it. Like I can smell the patchouli off her through the TV, you know. (laughs) Um, But then she's got this kind of um, uh, ghost, Whoopi Goldberg in ghost kind of Ophelia. You in danger, girl, as well. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> to me, she's like, yeah, this is what I mean. I know what you have. You're having a girl, la, la, la. But it's like, Ophelia, get out. Get out. That's what I get from her. So mm. to me, she's got that Whoopi Goldberg vibe as well and goes, so I'm here for her. I love Clara so much. She plays the character beautifully, brilliantly casted. Because it was sort of, when she was in the house, there was that heightened ten- tension, Gordon, when Clodagh kind of arrives because Ophelia knows she shouldn't have invited her to the house because yeah. she sneaks her out because Clodagh says this very dramatic thing, they're here. <laughs> you know, when the and car, I thought, I'm like, to I be fair. Was, they're going to be accosted by spirits like a Ghostbusters <laughs> or something like that. But I was in there going, he's... J- He's driving a fairly new BMW estate. And I don't think it's yeah. that loud. So maybe she does. Maybe she does have a, a They're uh, here a real. in a Prius. Yeah. Like, They're yeah. here. Yeah. But she she knows she shouldn't have her in the house, that Michael wouldn't like it. Is that yeah. what we're thinking? I think even like, not that they wouldn't like Claude particularly in the house, the character or the girl, the, the mad wee one from down the town. But like that they don't want anyone in the house giving her any information because she's now under like, psychological control of Michael and Mary that if she's getting any kind of outside info that she might break free of their spell or do you know as well the fact that like Clodagh had a, a, a child die yeah and obviously she's going through trauma trying to trying to I got mitigate her kind of grief yeah. by dealing with ghosts and ghoulies and all this kind of stuff maybe they don't want Ophelia going down that road or even Michael going down that road or even the father, Michael's father going down that road, dragging him down into something that's not maybe helpful. Because Hugh has just arrived back. And, and Hugh, he's got issues. Hugh has, well, he's obviously got the, well, he's got signs of Alzheimer's. Mm. So Hugh doesn't know what exactly is going on, but it does feel like he's someone 
he kind of I only speak the truth vibes about him because oh, yeah. he, he doesn't have a filter. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I feel that. Yeah. Claude is in stirring it. Maybe it might upset him. Yeah. Maybe Ophelia kind of feels like as well, it's not her house. You're just like having a party in not Thank Dara. You. It's giving not it loads. her house. Yes. But yet she's trying everything on, hanging around, wearing the clothes, having baths. How dare she clean herself? It's no, no, her. no, come on. I always do that when I go to hotels. I refuse to have a shower. I don't live here. No, she could have just had a quick shower, got herself dressed and gone home. No, she's having a bath with the bath salts that apparently and have rose bits petals. of light bulb in it. Yeah, yeah, it's a very specific brand that you have. It's a rare, it was bespoke. Before she salts. got maimed by the, the light bulb. Mm. Um very, so, very strange. Sean, Which you would feel if you're in the bath as well. Right? I know. You feel that immediately. I mean, she's like, oh, is there something on my back? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's when she lay I've down because she thought it was be- bath sauce. So we should just say she goes for a bath <laughs> and then she there's glass in the bath sauce and she mm. lies down and it's all the there. Fire in the house burst the light bulb. And- someone would have, someone would have sucked her blood if he needed to, 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 to give her the poison. He would have weed on her if that would have closed him up and that's Sean. Oh yeah. Sean, dude. <laughs> He's mad for it. He's mad for it. Yeah. Like he I is, can see him is. just lunging. He is. I'm he just is. like, just, just stick the head and see what happens. Yeah. He invites her to a music gig in, of course, Sheila's because yeah. everything happens in the town in Sheila's place. I want to get a drink at Sheila's. Yeah, you know I want to go down to Sheila's. You need to go to Sheila's. At yeah. the very end, we find out that she's having a baby girl because she had to go to Letterkenny <gasps> Medical Centre. Um, After the light bulb incident. And we've got Mary saying, I told Told you it would be a girl again, bringing in the supernatural element, and boom! At the end, we've got Ophelia tied up again, and a new character introduced in Cambridge, holding Michael's book. Like he literally just has to look at camera. That was a good day's work for him. Tall, dark, and handsome. Great day's work. Great yeah. day's work. Great day's work. So, where do you think we're going to in the next episode with with how it ended? I have no clue. Am I watching Rosemary's Baby? The Shining? <laughs> I, I just, I don't know, a ghost. There's definitely Where is this going? I have no clue. Definitely something to do with the fight that uh, Michael and Ruth had in their office. Ruth went in and pretended to be Roisin <gasps> in the hospital to get at the da. We had and he's like this. squaring off against her, getting very aggressive. We can see the element, like the facade has fallen from his face. Mm. The manipulation is out. The claws are out. He's like... Yeah. I bleed and knock you out. You keep on going around. <laughs> Nye me da, or whatever. And uh, <laughs> that's, 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 uh, it's uh, pitch Spot perfect. On. Spot on. Um, yeah. But there's Spot a very on. sinister side we see to Michael in this episode for the first time. Uh, Whereas like oh, for the first episode, it's like intimated. Mm. You know, there's little clues. This one straight up, he's like, step back Ruth mm. you know? and we don't know if Ruth is there because she doesn't trust Michael or because she is secretly in love with Michael that's something that we've got to wait to Levels. see yeah. that's unfolded she Absolutely. did present to be his dead wife to go and see her dad that's a bit creepy dad. too it's slightly creepy looking forward to next week Nadine is like Everyone, what's I'm, happening <laughs> everything is just crazy and not so dark. and is Sean good guy is he really the hero or is he like crazy as well he's insatiable he's I mean, ins- it might Stick the head, Nadine. This is like a prequel to uh, Normal People. Nadine. He was a fireman <laughs> in the summer pub. before he went to college. He's going to stick the head in you as well. Yeah. Nadine oh, Gordon, thank like you that. so much thank for you your so take much. on episode Thanks. two. I reckon next week episode, I think we might be cranking up the crazy a uh, little bit. So we're mm-hmm. looking forward to another mm-hmm. deep dive with you next week, guys. Thank you so okay. much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. You're not the first. You won't be the last. And it's my wife is dead. We set it in motion. When are you going to see that man for what he is? You're not well. No, 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 please. Which one of us are they going to believe? I do wonder. And it's coming closer. You're listening to Hooked on the Deceived and we are joined now by some of the creative team behind the series. Director Chloe Thomas, producer Imogen O'Sullivan and composer Hannah Peel. You're all very welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having us. That's now... Nice. Imogen, if I can talk with you as the producer, you have been on board since this project all began when it was just a wee little baby. How did it all come about? Um, yeah, well, it's pretty amazing to think about the journey it's been on. Um, it came into our the production company I work for, New Pictures, I think probably about five years ago. Uh, and Toby and Lisa, the writers, uh, I think Lisa was pregnant at the time with their first child and they'd been watching all of these classic kind of Hitchcock movies that they loved. And they were thinking about whether it was possible to do a kind of modern update of those classic domestic thriller type movies. And Lisa was really inspired by kind of the feeling of being pregnant and what that does to your mind and the kind of psychological journey that she was going on at the time. 
So all of those ideas, which I think you can see in the show now, were right back there in the first one page pitch that Lisa and Toby brought to the company. And then over the kind of five years since they brought it to us, it's developed in so many amazing ways uh, until it's become the incredible show that you guys are watching at the moment. And it's kind of prophetic because, you know, it's five years ago, but course of control, uh, the fact, you know, that's that's a criminal, that's a that's a crime now. It's it's so in the zeitgeist and people are really talking about it. It's kind of hit the nail on the head at the right time, Imogen. Completely, yeah, yeah. And I think what we found when we were working on the show and speaking to lots of people involved is that uh, it's a, a frighteningly and very sadly common thing that a lot of people have experienced or have friends have experienced. And it felt like it really hit a moment, as you're saying, but also something that happens to a lot of people and that people mm. have personal experience of. So I think that's often why it chimed so much with kind of the cast and the crew who were reading the scripts is that it speaks to something that feels very real to a lot of people. And Hannah, did you all get to hang out, you know, before before this all began, before you started filming and getting the music together? Yeah, I mean, I met Imogen and Chloe in Belfast and took them to a show and <laughs> where we talked about musical ideas and watched a group that we wanted to use actually at the time, but unfortunately couldn't in the end. But um, yeah, it's yeah, we did get to hang out in the beginning, but we haven't met since, obviously, with lockdown and everything else. So... Yeah, I remember when people got to hang out. It was so much, so much fun. Now, Chloe, you're from Cambridge and your father was an academic. Come here to me. Like when you were a kid going to see your dad at work, were there lecturers that looked like Michael? Like, were they that ridiculously hot? No, I grew up in Oxford and my dad was uh, quite a shambolic, um, you know, one of those very left wing hairy, looked like, you know, uh, John Lennon late on, you know, little glasses, whole thing. <laughs> Um, and now I live in Cambridge, but I'll never support Cambridge in the boat race ever because I'm an Oxford girl. <laughs> anyway, um, so he was quite a sort of, you know, polytechnic sort of thing. But basically, they all look really shambolic. And now I live in Cambridge. It's, it's the land of the fleece. I mean, I said to Emmett, if he walked, if, if every academic looked like him, they'd have women hanging off their trousers because Emmett is so, you know, so good looking and so charismatic. Um, but that's perfect for Michael because he'd really stick out. And also being being Irish, you know, would make him really, I don't know, I'm going to say exotic. It, it, you know, it would, it would just make him a real superstar. And I think that's that's what, you know, that's how Emmett comes across. So it works really well. Yeah, I had I had one good looking um, lecturer in college and I hated poetry. He was my poetry tutor. And my God, I went to every single bloody tutorial because he was really nice to look at. Now, Chloe, like, I think it's crazy what's happened because, of course, Paul Meskell's star power, it has gone through the roof. And he was a complete unknown when he was working on mm. The Deceived. He'd done some great work in the theatre, but, you know, it was nothing like it is now. Uh, tell me about his audition tape, because it came with one clear message and that was offers only. What's that about? Mm. So that means that they're not going to audition for you again, actors. That you know, this is it. So they'll 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 read for you on tape, or if they're really like big stars, they'll just say, "Yes, I'm interested. Do you want me?" We you don't get to audition them. You don't even sometimes get to meet them if they're really really big. So we um, so we'd heard, you know, we knew it was in normal people. Normal people's a massive book. Uh, Imogen was going, oh, "I love normal people." It's my you know, it's my favourite. But we knew that it was, you know, because of the pedigree of everyone involved, it was going to be really, really good. It was a Hulu series. Everyone was excited about it, but no one had seen any of it at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. But he, so I watched the, so I was like, yeah, uh, right, okay, yeah. So I watched it and he had some, you know, it's the hardest thing is to be normal. It's really hard to be normal as an actor, to, to be a normal man, a normal woman. And I just saw it and I thought, he's brilliant. Let's just hire him. Yeah, fine. You know, I didn't actually watch. <laughs> I didn't watch any of the others because I thought, right, I'm not going to watch any others. Offer it to him. Hope he does it. I was a bit blasé about it because I thought, he said he's a second role. He's not, it can't be, you know, he's not that much in demand. <laughs> and it was like, he loved Lisa McGee and that was great. He loved the project. So you know, he said yes. And then before he said yes, I started getting panic. I thought, maybe I should watch some of the others. And and then I did. And I thought, no, he's really good. I really want Paul. And luckily he said yes. And he's just 
uh, and as soon as he was on there, you can just see it, you. We could see what now everyone knows mm. that he's really good. You get to be that people like that 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 saw Adele when there was only five people there. You were there first. You knew before <laughs> everybody yeah. else. It's so evocative, Hannah, what you've managed to do on this series from the opening, you know, from the opening score with the credits right through to how you you've turned the house into a character with the creepy sounds, Hannah. How did you how did you manage that? <laughs> um, so actually, Chloe and the team allowed me to go on to set um, during filming. It was actually near the end of filming and it was a Sunday when there was no one around. There was no heating on. It was completely dead. And me and the sound guy just went and I recorded loads of sounds from the house itself. So uh, like the, the creaking door, this like the beautiful cut crystal glass that they have in the house, just the owners had, um, like this fridge had a hum that sounded like this weird drone, old people's choir. <laughs> um, so I just took all those sounds and made a real kind of bed out of it, which allowed me to have this kind of I guess, I guess a connection to the house and like a connection to the cast and everybody else, which normally you wouldn't get in a show. It'd normally be me in a room on my own composing. Um, and also it kind of added this layer under the string scoring of like Ophelia's kind of mind state and the things that she was going through. Like I was able to kind of draw out different sounds in order to play with her psychology, if, as it were. Yeah, you, you yeah. completely did. Thank you for freaking the crap out of me. But you got close to this house. You learned so much about it, Hannah. And then Chloe, on, on the last day on set, you lit fire to it. How, how was that? Was well, that a bit not, of crack? Well, no, not the actual location, which was... Uh, but we... we um, God, I'm just really concerned about spoilers, but there aren't any, obviously, now. But it, it, so it's... Um, it was a set. It was built, raised up, because... Um, and we really wanted to show it burning. So we, on the last day, on the very last day, on the very last thing, it had all been fireproofed. And we had three cameras in fireproof housing. And obviously they had to be remotely controlled. And uh, we, oh, I can hear an echo. And, and so we put gas lines down and then lit the whole thing. And then we had about... 45 seconds of really fantastic burning. And I actually persuaded the special effects guys who are all from Game of Thrones. That's why they were so brilliant at burning stuff. They're just brilliant. And a lot of the things we'd use were Game of Thrones. Like there was a metal dummy that we used as the shape, you know, was in it. it uh, so, you know, and then, so when it went up, it was really exciting. We got the sound effects guys, I persuade, sorry, special effects guys to dress up as firemen. Uh, oh. So I could film them. So you could film them do that. Imogen, you look so proud there when you were talking about, yeah, it was from Game of Thrones. We had it all. You went out there and sorted it out. When you saw what you'd created, Imogen, this this psychological thriller that no one knows, is, is, is it supernatural? What's happening? Were you just kind of going, that's my baby. I love it so much. It was a pretty amazing thing to behold. <laughs> I think... I think when you've seen something develop on the page over a long time and then you're part of the process of getting all the pieces together and talking to everybody at every stage about even the tiny decisions like the handwriting on the notes or anything like that or the post-its in the office, small, like all the tiny details, the minute you see it come together, it just feels unreal. It really does. It feels like a dream. It's amazing. And then you get a whole other brilliant part of the process when you put the music and the sound and the special effects and it's edited together beautifully and then you see it again on screen and you're like, wow, it's just amazing that it's gone on this incredible journey with such, such talented people at every single stage. Chloe Thomas, Imogen O'Sullivan and Hannah Peel, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Hooked on the Deceived. And that's all we've got time for for this podcast. Uh, next week, the drama goes into some dark and twisted places. You don't want to miss our deep dive into episode three, along with our interview with the show's creators, Lisa McGee and Tobias Beer. From me, Maureen O'Connell, we'll chat to you next week on Hooked on the Deceived. When are you going to see that man for what he is? Which one of us are they going to believe? I do wonder. And it's coming closer